Hello everybody, today we are going to talk about mitral valve diseases and basically we will focus on mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis. I won't go into different causes, anatomy or pathophysiology, but we will just touch some key points and things that you need to remember when you are taking care of patients who have mitral valve disease. So we're going to start with two different problems that can arise in these patients with mitral valve disease it can be mitral regurgitation or the leakage of the valve or when there is a lot of calcification or rheumatic heart disease where the mitral valve leaklets get tethered and you have what we call like a mitral stenosis. So with that we start with the mitral regurgitation. One is called primary mitral regurgitation another one is called secondary. So in this primary mitral regurgitation there is abnormality of the valve. So the valve leaflet, the mitral valve leaflets are abnormal. It can be from myxomatous degeneration or it can be from infective endocarditis. And mainly what I will be focusing today is, you know, the ischemia or ACS or STEMI patients who, who have complications from their myocardial infarction leading to the mitral valve apparatus that gets damaged and you have what we call like a mitral regurgitation. The secondary causes of mitral regurgitation is where the valve leaflets are fine. They don't have any problem. They are okay. It's just that the whole anatomy of the left ventricle is changed that causes the leakage in the valve. So, for example, in this picture one here, if you see that the left ventricle here has got a very thin wall, it's dilated. So, if somebody with congestive heart failure, maybe EF around 20-25%. So, basically what's happening is the LV is getting stretched. It's just like a soccer ball now. And when it does that, it kind of pulls the leaflets apart. And now you have this opening here and then the mitral regurgitation. So again, as I said, there is nothing wrong with the valve, the valve apparatus, everything is good. It's just that the whole LV is stretched and it's causing the regurgitation. So that's called a secondary, a secondary mitral regurgitation. And that is where, you know, there is a lot of uh, interest recently in mitral crypt. So these patients, if they are very symptomatic, and they are not surgical candidate, they can go and have what we call like a mitral clip. Basically what happens in the mitral clip is if these are two leaflets, the mitral clip just kind of goes across these two leaflets and then tethers them together so that they don't get pulled apart. And, and then instead of like one big opening, now you have two small opening. So the whole idea is to decrease the regurgitation. If they are surgical candidates, then they can go for what we call like a mitral ring. So mitral ring is basically like a C-shaped metallic ring that the surgeons can go in. If you go back to that picture one here, they can put that ring across the annulus of the uh, mitral valve and then they can press it so that it comes together and it kind of brings everything together and the leaflets together and thus decreasing the mitral regurgitation. So that's your secondary mitral regurgitation where, as, as I said, you, re you just really want to change the anatomy. It's not the valve that um, is abnormal. With that, we come to the, again, to the primary mitral regurgitation, as I talked about. I won't go into the degenerative diseases like myxomatous degenerations, um, if they have abnormal reflats, if they have congenital abnormalities. But basically what I'll want you to focus on is when these patients who have normal valve and then their their valve you know gets damaged so what happens uh, in these patients let's say for example somebody comes with an inferior wall MI so here I have a cross section in picture 2 here I'll just put some arrows here this I have a picture of a left ventricle that is cut in a short axis so that this is your LV, this is your RV, this is the interventricular septum here, 
this is your anterior wall this is your lateral wall and this is your posterior wall so what i want you to uh, kind of pay attention is is this papillary muscle here this papillary muscle is called a posterior medial papillary muscle the way i remember that is a mnemonic called pimp pmp posterior medial papillary muscle and i'll come back to it why is it important to to bring this papillary muscle in this discussion so if you see this uh, kind of a light bluish color here this area which is the interventricular septum and part of the inferior wall is supplied by the rca so if somebody has an rca stemi they cut off the supply to the papillary muscle the posterior medial papillary muscle and why is that because it's got a single blood supply and that is only from the rca whereas if you look at this posterior lateral papillary muscle here in the picture i'll just circle it it's got dual supply it is supplied by the left circumflex as well as its led so if somebody has a massive anterior wall mi with the led occluded they will still have that posterior lateral papillary muscle supplied by the left circumflex similarly if they have a left circumflex mi the the and the led will still be supplying this posterior lateral papillary muscle so if this is that pimp or pmp or posterior medial papillary muscle that if somebody's got a massive rca infarction or stemi they can get papillary muscle rupture and that is a very you know um common board question they really like to to ask about this and why is it which muscle is involved papillary muscle is involved and why is it involved so here in picture three i'll just circle that is where you see the anatomy here so this is your papillary muscle which is ruptured and now you have this leaflet which is kind of flail so flail meaning it just goes into the left atrium so what happens will be there will be a lot of regurgitation so whenever the lv will contract instead of injecting the blood into the aorta portion of that will go into the left atrium one interesting thing and I, as I, again as i said they will ask you on the board is you might not hear the murmur and why is that because we know that there is a leaflet is flail and there is a lot of regurgitation going into the left atrium why would you not hear the murmur so in most cases you will not hear the murmur because there is a rapid equalization of pressures between the left ventricle and the left atrium so here it is an acute process the left atrium did not have any chance to dilate it's still compliant so what will happen is when the left ventricle will contract the whole blood will go into the left atrium there is a rapid equalization of pressures when there is a rapid equalization of pressure you will not have any turbulence and obviously you will not hear the murmur what does that signify it signifies is that when the left atrium is not compliant and is not able to accommodate the blood coming from the left ventricle it will just push the blood into the the pulmonary vein and there from there it's going to go to the lungs so these patients who have massive rca infarction or stemi now they have developed papillary muscle rupture they will won't have any murmur but they will come with frank pulmonary edema again as i said the left atrium is not had any time to kind of dilate and accommodate that blood it's just going to dump that blood into the pulmonary vein and here in picture 4 if you see this lady somebody who had a inferior wall mi and now they you know they get revascularized they come to the to the icu the next thing is the nurse calls you and saying the patient cannot breathe here the patient is like kind of sitting upright which is a classic sign that the patient might have papillary muscle rupture so the patient is upright trying to get that blood that's in the lung on the lower portion of the lung so that she can still breathe so what the treatment yes you can stabilize these patients by medications inotropes but really the treatment in these patients is surgery they have a very high mortality and the best thing that you can do for these patients is instead of calling you know 
temporizing measures, medications, dibutamine, and things like that, or diuresis, call your surgeon. Tell them, hey, this patient needs a bedside echo, and the patient needs to go to the to the OR to get that, you know, valve replacement or or, or repair. Repair might not be an option because of the the all this, you know, uh, myocardial infarction and the muscles, which will be very very, you know, inflammatory, and and the surgeons might not be able to repair it because they need to have a healthy tissue to kind of take their sutures. So these patients need to go to the OR. So did that we come to the picture four here. So here, it's an interesting thing. Here again, uh, it's like a, you know, milder version of the RCA infarction. So basically what's happening is somebody has an RCA infarction and now they have this papillary muscle which is scarred. So it's like a late complication, but it does happen. So what we call this is called ischemic MR. So basically what's happening is the patient had a massive RCA infarction, the posterior medial papillary muscle got, um, had um, infarction ischemia uh, resulting in the scar formation. And when that happens, this leaflet, the posterior leaflet will get retracted and you will have this murmur and you can hear the murmur again as i said since it's going to develop over a period of weeks the left atrium might little dilate and you might hear the murmur in these patients again if there is a massive amount of mr going into that this patient might need the the mitral valve repair or replacement so with that we come to the to the another problem that we talked about the mitral stenosis so basically again as i said it can be for multiple reasons it can be senile where you have a patient who is elderly in, in their 80s they have a lot of calcification on the valve and then the valve leaflets are not you know pliable anymore they're they're stuck and you can have an obstruction of blood flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle so when that will happen, the left atrium will start to dilate. And the left atrial pressures may go up and the echo can kind of uh, could be a diagnostic in these patients. Or it can be from rheumatic heart disease. Not really commonly seen here, but in third world countries, it is a common problem in younger patients where they have rheumatic heart disease and then mitral stenosis. So on an echocardiogram, when you have these patients who go for an echo, the echo reading might say, oh, they have a gradient. Let's say, for example, 10 or 15, which is in a severe range. What does that mean, the gradient? Basically, the idea is if your mitral valve is open, the pressure inside the left atrium should be equal to the pressure in the left ventricle. So that's the whole idea. That's a normal physiology. But if for some reason you have this stenosis or there's this obstruction here or the calcification and the mitral valve is, you know, uh, calcified, at one point of the cardiac cycle, the pressure inside the left atrium will be higher than the pressure in the left ventricle. And this is what all it is. It is a pressure difference between the LA and the LV. So that's your gradient. It can be two. They might say peak gradient or it can be a mean gradient. So the peak gradient is, is the maximum gradient that will, you know, reach at certain point during the cardiac cycle. So that's called the peak gradient. But I want, really want you to, to, to look when you look at an echo read is that What's the mean gradient? So the mean gradient is basically they are kind of averaging it over the entire cardiac cycle. Say, what, what's the difference between the left atrium and the left pressure, left ventricle, ventricular pressure? And that is measured as gradient. So the gradient, it, it, if it is 10 or 15, it's severe mitral stenosis. Again, as I said, in a normal person with a normal valve, there shouldn't be no gradient. The pressure in the left atrium should be equal to the pressure in the left ventricle. And then the echo, as I said, can measure that. 
Another way of measuring that could be you can put a catheter, like a pigtail catheter, in the left ventricle, like we measure LVEDP during the cath. And then you can put a swan gans or a PA catheter through the right side. It's going to go into the lungs, and that swan gans will give you the wedge pressure. So we know the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is an indirect measurement of the left atrial pressure. So in this case, if you want to really look that, you can look at the waveform, simultaneous waveform in the left ventricle and the wedge, and you can kind of trace how much of the difference between the wedge and the LVEDP is, and that will be your gradient in the cath lab. Not a very accurate one, but still if the, your echo is not diagnostic, and you want to, you know, further investigate that, you can have these invasive uh, procedures to kind of see exactly what's going on. Thank you very much.